Just like religious apologists, alternative medicine fans recycle a few old, tired arguments to defend their stances. So I thought I'd compile seven that I hear very often and debunk them. Let's go. Are there side effects with homeopathic remedies? In a word, no. Homeopathic remedies don't produce side effects like uh, pharmaceuticals produce side effects. For a lot of alternative medicine, the no side effects thing is totally correct, actually. In the cases of homeopathy and detox foot baths, for instance, there are no side effects. And that's because those treatments don't have any effects. There can't be side effects if a treatment doesn't have any significant effects in the first place. However, even if an alternative treatment has no significant effects on the body, they can still come with significant harms. All treatments should be evaluated through weighing their benefits and harms on all levels. This includes their monetary cost, uh, the time they consume, and their health effects. So even if a treatment relies on placebo and has no side effects, it can still result in a net loss for a person using that treatment. The expenditure of time and money on a treatment that hasn't been demonstrated to work is more harmful to the user than it is beneficial. It's just a waste. Another angle on this assertion is this. The way we know an evidence-based medication's side effects is because it's been tested. The side effects on a medication's label are all those that have been observed in clinical trials. The extensive research behind conventional evidence-based medicine is actually the reason for side effects being known and listed. So some people think that many alternative treatments have no side effects, and that's because no clinical trials are required to sell any type of alternative medicine. Side effects could be there, but we don't know that because of lack of testing. Or maybe that substance actually does nothing either way. Still, using an alternative treatment can be harmful time and money-wise, even if it doesn't have any side effects. What I experienced with homeopathy was absolutely incredible. I started noticing my anxiety would go away, my depression would go away. And I was so excited to share this with my patients. I believe in the depths of my heart in the power of naturopathic medicine. I have seen the impossible. The body is so brilliant in its ability to heal itself if we just honor and respect it. Personal experience is not a reliable source of evidence because it's subject to all kinds of bias, like confirmation bias, where you notice and remember things that confirm what you already believe and ignore anything that conflicts. If you don't have some kind of controls to eliminate bias from the equation, your observations will always be skewed and unreliable. There's also something called the placebo effect that could be involved in a lot of experiences of symptom relief. Basically, you really could have experienced relief from certain symptoms after using a certain alternative treatment, but the effects could have just been a result of your expectation of those effects. That's why in clinical trials of any given drug or therapy, scientists set up controls to prevent bias and achieve more objective results. They also compare observed effects to those achieved purely by placebo to make sure that their treatment is really effective. Also, personal experiences of one person often contradict the personal experiences of others. You say that in your experience, lavender oil cures headaches. Well, my experience doesn't say that. Our conflicting experiences are equally as valid in that neither one of them can prove our claims. It's really fascinating that we have the molecular science and the understanding today how essential oils do work on a molecular level. Did you know that essential oils are referenced more than 300 times in the Bible and they were used as really the most powerful form of medicine during that day. And so essential oils were revered in the Bible. They were used for everything. And that's why I know myself, Jordan Rubin, we love using essential oils for ourselves, our families, and for our patients on a regular basis. This does not imply that something works. Like I said, personal experience can be the result of bias and placebo, even on the level of an entire culture. If you don't believe me, just look at a religion you don't believe in. There are thousands of folk remedies that have been around for thousands of years that don't work. Do you think drilling holes in someone's head relieves them of evil spirits that cause headaches and even depression? No, but that's been around for thousands of years. Also, for the thousands of years that your folk medicine of choice has been the only option, why was the average age only about 40 or so? And if that folk remedy is still the best option, why is life expectancy so much longer now that modern conventional medicine is used more? And I absolutely believe in the power of essential oils. I absolutely believe that. Not only as being able to see it firsthand, the testimonials, and to see how it has changed people's lives, but also as an unbiased scientist. 
looking at the thousands of articles published across the course of history. Just because an article involves an alternative remedy doesn't mean it's actually research supported. Just because there's a positive result doesn't mean it works. Just because a study is well designed doesn't mean it's proven. To be properly research supported, an alternative remedy needs to have at least one, if not a few, systematic reviews or meta-analyses of several well-designed, randomized controlled trials in favor of the remedy's efficacy. Those meta-analyses then have to be subject to further peer review. That's a huge order to fill for any substance proposed to have medicinal effects, but that's exactly what therapies used in conventional medicine have to undergo before being used and accepted. I've had a lot of people make claims on my essential oils video that essential oils are research supported. Nearly every one of those people said, just search essential oils on pubmed.com and you'll find several hundreds of articles involving essential oils. And that's true, you will. But it's obvious that those who make those claims don't understand my previous point. First of all, PubMed is just an archive for medical articles both good and bad. There's some useful stuff on PubMed, but there's also the original study showing the now debunked link between vaccines and autism. Just because it's on PubMed doesn't mean it's good science. Also, the vast majority of articles about essential oils on PubMed are small sample preliminary animal trials or just involve dripping essential oils onto bacterial colonies in petri dishes to see if they're antimicrobial. If that's your standard for what is and isn't medicine, then tequila is just as much of a cure-all as any essential oil. If every girl in this country took 200 micrograms of selenium in one generation, we'd eliminate breast cancer by 82%. That's a big number. Why aren't we doing that? Because medicine in the United States is a for-profit industry, and most people are completely unaware of this, and most people bow down to the altar of MD-directed high-tech medicine. Yes, pharmaceutical companies are businesses. They are out to make money. Sometimes, or a lot of times, they become corrupt and behave unethically. But on that front, alternative medicine companies are absolutely no different. In fact, alternative medicine in the U.S. is a $30 billion per year industry. The difference is, conventional medicines have to be painstakingly tested before they can go on the market. Alternative therapies and supplements, on the other hand, don't. Like, at all. It's so easy to sell supplements that even Alex Jones can pull it off. InfoWars has developed with top researchers, top chemists, top scientists, top doctors, things like Anthroplex. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthroplex is the newest addition at InfoWarsLife.com. Read the facts for yourself at InfoWarsLife.com. See the informational videos and find out why the compounds in here are absolutely designed and are on record to be some of the best shots we've got at countering and blocking the globalist operations. So what sounds more vulnerable to corruption? A multi-billion dollar industry that's required to subject every single one of their products to rigorous testing, or a multi-billion dollar industry that can put any unregulated substance on the market alongside nebulous claims of balancing and detoxification? Chemicals don't work. Nature works. Mm -hmm. If nature creates a problem, nature creates a solution. Very simple and easy. If it didn't exist 100 years ago, you don't need it today. But many of the constituents that are so effective in essential oils have been synthetically made and commercialized, and we use them in our daily lives and not even realize it. You know, the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, the, the, they know they work. They don't want you to believe it is, but all they do is really try to copy that which nature has made and sell it to you. A lot of medications are derived from plants. Aspirin, for example, was originally partially derived from the bark of a willow tree. But there's a few reasons that taking the real thing would not be a better alternative. First of all, plant-derived medications are highly refined and often combined with other substances not found in plants. They're also clinically tested multiple times before going to market. Both of those things to say, pharmaceuticals are precisely manufactured and tested so that all batches come out the same and so that we know exactly what effects they'll have each time they're taken. Plants, on the other hand, are subject to change with every season. The amount of any medicinally useful substance they produce varies all the time. That means by taking plant-based medicine alone, you actually have less control over what you're taking and are less likely to have consistent outcomes. Second of all, most herbal medicines are classified as supplements, which are not strictly regulated in the same way that medications are. They're regulated in the same way as food. Brands aren't allowed to mislabel their supplements, but they're not required to test their efficacy at all. This, however, definitely doesn't stop them from selling their products alongside arbitrary claims that I already mentioned here.
molecular shapes and sizes of the molecules of essential oils are so compatible with our human body and that they fit the receptor sites on the cells so perfectly. So to me that means that these oils who fit us so well and were created before we were created, that God was thinking ahead. If you make a claim that a substance has a supernatural origin, you have to provide evidence to substantiate that claim. Simply stating that something does have a supernatural origin isn't evidence for its potency. In reality, that really just adds another outlandish element to your overall claim, making it even more difficult to substantiate. The main defense I hear of this claim is, we know God made it because it works so perfectly with our bodies. And we know without peer-reviewed research that it works perfectly with our bodies because God made it. Duh. So we know something is perfect because God made it, and we know that God made it because it's perfect? That's a circular argument, it doesn't work. Now, if someone argues that a naturally occurring, research-supported medicinal substance was created by a divine being, then the burden of proof would be on them to demonstrate any supernatural elements to that medicine. But to my knowledge, and I think to the knowledge of the greater medical community, that's never been done. As a philosophical naturalist, this is because, in my opinion, all that could ever be demonstrated to exist is definitionally natural. And, you know, because God is about as real as Ravi Zacharias experienced studying quantum physics at Cambridge. I studied under John Polkinghorne at Cambridge University. You probably know the name. One of the world's leading quantum physicists. But is it true? I filed a series of information requests with Cambridge and learned that not only had Mr. Zacharias never been a visiting scholar at their university, but that John Polkinghorne didn't even teach a physics class in 1990. And there you have it. I hope that these arguments have been sufficiently debunked for you. If you don't think so, then let me know down in the comments. But as always, thanks for watching. I've been Drew from Genetically Modified Skeptic. Go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. You can also follow me on Twitter at GM Skeptic. And until next time, everyone, stay skeptical.